Thanks, guys. I hope everybody enjoyed their lunch. Mine was, mine was fantastic. Anyways, it is my pleasure to in introduce the next spe speaker, uh, Dr. Jim Gaffney um, of DuPont Pioneer. He's been with DuPont Pioneer since 2010 in his role working at advancing ergonomic traits, including water use efficiency and nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, Gaffney, uh, Jim, <laughs> Jim Gaffney um, earned his master or his BS in University of Minnesota, uh, his master's in South Dakota State, and his PhD in University of Florida. He's particularly passionate about improving African agriculture, an interest that, an interest that dates back to his time with, his, with the Peace Corps in Cameroon in Central Africa, where he worked with an agricultural technical school. As a former farm kid, uh, based or grew up in, in southern Minnesota, uh, Jim stays connected with his roots in uh, agronomy and regularly, uh, and in his, in his role right now as regulatory product strategy lead at DuPont Pioneer. Today he'll be talking to us about the eight plus decades of research at DuPont Pioneer, abiotic stress, efficient use of resources, and global challenge. Jim? So thank you, Kevin, for that uh, nice introduction, and thank you, Betsa and Kevin, for all the emails to keep me on my toes and get, keep me prepared and making sure I got here on time and in the right place. You, the grad students, everyone, you've done a fantastic job of organizing this. I know this isn't easy. It takes a lot of time. So uh, excellent job. So I just want to state, to start with here, that this is not a terribly technical presentation. You know, when Nataba asked me to come here, and the, knowing the audience was molecular biologists and breeders made me a little anxious because I'm an agronomist, so I really like to see the uh, sticker you brought, I'm an agronomist. Uh, I'm not a breeder, I'm not a molecular biologist, uh, but I think I can convey some of the interesting things we are working on at DuPont Pioneer and maybe think a little bit about how that fits into uh, your plans going forward. So I want to just introduce myself a little bit further and introduce DuPont Pioneer. Sometimes it helps if you know who, who's up here talking to you, and so I can give you a little more background there. I want to talk just a little bit about what we are doing in Pioneer uh, around abiotic stress, some of the tools and technology we're implementing. The resource utilization piece is part and parcel of the entire presentation, so you'll see that throughout. Uh, and then I want to end with meeting the global challenge and talk a little bit about perhaps some ideas of what your role could be in this. So, uh, like Kevin mentioned, I'm a product of the land-grant university system. Uh, I'm very proud of that. I think in a lot of ways, the land-grant university system is the envy of the world. Uh, the little stars that you see there are different places I've lived. Uh, Florida, uh, New Jersey, then to Des Moines, then to Champaign, then to Raleigh, North Carolina, and then back to Des Moines, where I am now in Johnston, Iowa. So one thing, if you're interviewing someday and, and your interviewing manager asks you uh, if you're willing to relocate, the correct answer is yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's important. Uh, and I have no regrets about the different relocations. You know, my first job was in New Jersey, and I said, are you kidding me? Uh, and it turned out to be an excellent place to, have, to, to work, uh, and I learned a lot there. It really was a great start to my career. So even though on the face of things you might not like the first place you might want to live or you might not be dreaming of living someplace where they want to relocate you, accept it. Learn from it. Build from it. Uh, it can be really good experiences. The star in Africa there, of course, is uh, uh, Cameroon, Central Africa. So I was a Peace Corps volunteer there for a few years. And I still have uh, connections and personal connections and aspirations back in Cameroon. Uh, just last March, so about a year ago now, uh, I went back there in time for the cassava planting season. Cassava is big in southern Cameroon. It's, it's their main food crop along with plantains, I suppose. So I just want you to get a look at this picture. We are, you know, what happened here at the end of the dry season, we, you know, you cut down the brush, this is by no means virgin rainforest. This has been cropped for generations. Uh, but they won't come back to this particular spot for another five to 10 years probably with cassava. Um, so you chop down the brush. You can see those, those ash piles where the brush was burned. Uh, and then you have to, for cassava, you have to 
make uh, piles of soil about this high, a couple feet wide, a couple feet high, and then you stick the uh, cutting into the, into the soil and pray for rain. Of course, by the end of the dry season, after all that brush is out there growing, this, this soil is really unforgiving and very hard. And lest you think I was just running around taking photos of all the hard work, uh, I was actually in on it, right? Now, I didn't last very long. <laughs> being, in the, being a desk jockey in cube land there at, at, in Johnston, uh, it's hard work. Uh, and that, there's a pretty big shovel on the end of that daba, right? Uh, and it wears you out in a hurry. I've experimented, experimented with different things to try to make it a little easier, longer handled hole, that kind of stuff. It doesn't work. This is the way we do it. Unless you're going to invest in major horsepower and really get after it, this is really the best method. Uh, so I want you to think about that rainforest situation, the way that was grown, the slash and burn agriculture that still is popular, because we're going to come back to cassava a little bit later. So part of my job at DuPont Pioneer is uh, as regulatory strategy lead is uh, charting a path to the global regulatory uh, global regulatory agencies to bring transgenic traits through the system in what we like to say is in a uh, aggressive and predictable timeline and get those products into the hands of farmers whether it's United States, India, Africa as quickly as possible to try to make our our customers happier and more productive. Uh, that's easier said than done in some cases. It's, e it's easy, you know, sometimes to take pot shots at uh, our government these days because it does seem like not a lot of good is coming out of Washington, D.C. I will tell you, though, that the U United States Department of Agriculture, as a regulatory agency, is very science based and they're very uh, objective. And our job is to help demonstrate safety of these transgenic traits to humans and the environment. And all we ask out of regulatory agencies anywhere in the world is that they are science-based and they're objective. So we can really look to the USDA as one of those agencies. So we don't complain too much about USDA these days. They, and, and I'll tell you what, other agencies around the globe look at the USDA as well. So it's something that we're actually thankful for. Of course, we always wish they would look at our our uh, dossiers, our transgenic traits quicker than the competitions and move them through quicker. Uh, but in general, things are going well and we want to keep it that way. Um, so moving on a little bit to DuPont. DuPont was started in 1802 in Wilmington, Delaware area. Uh, they, their claim to fame at the time was making gunpowder. And they made a really good, high-quality gunpowder and sold it to the U.S. military. Of course, it was a very fledgling U.S. military at the time. But that's how they got their start. More recently, they are really uh, looking much more carefully at food security and energy sectors. And we have sustainability goals at DuPont Pioneer uh, and at DuPont in general uh, that look at things like how much we invest in food security, uh, how many new products that we bring to market every year. We also look at smallholder agriculture and education in developing economies. And we have some pretty big numbers for what we plan to hit by 2020. And sometimes I look at them and I think, these are, these are aspirational. We're not gonna be able to hit these. As a matter of fact, we do have people that actually <laughs> maintain some pretty strict metrics and we work very hard to hit those metrics. Uh, I would also encourage you, uh, now. That, this is proprietary information. You can't see our sustainability goals, I don't think. But I would encourage you to look at the United Nations sustainability goals that came out in 20, 2015. Uh, they are aspirational. I think there's 17 of them. So if you just Google United Nations sustainability goals, it'll pop up. There's 17 of them. It might help you kind of look at your careers and what you're doing in life and where you might fit into these goals. They truly are sustainable, uh, aspirational. You know, it's, I think number one is eliminating all poverty everywhere in the world. It's like, okay, and we're gonna do that by 2030. So you get an idea of, you know, their heart's in the right place, but it's gonna be pretty tough to hit that. Um, so that's, that's DuPont. Now Pioneer uh, was started in 1926, and my original title, I apologize, Betsa and Kevin, my original title was eight plus decades, and then I realized, holy cow, it's, 90, it's nine decades, right? It's 90 years. In May, it's 90 years since 
uh, Henry Wallace started Pioneer. Uh, and he started with the idea that hybrids provided more value than open pollinated varieties, and he was charging more for them. In the first 10 years of, of his company, he had a real tough time convincing farmers that there was any additional value. It wasn't until the droughts in 1934 and 1936 where those hybrids really outyielded very significantly most of the OPVs that were currently being planted at the time. And that's when his business really started to take off. By 1957, we had enough information available to us that we thought a, a drought, a dedicated drought research station uh, was in order, which we started in York, Nebraska. And of course, you know, by then, hybrids were probably on uh, over 90% of the acres. Henry Wallace was a, a very interesting character. He uh, went on to be vice president and secretary of agriculture for Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, in his position as uh, secretary of agriculture, he promoted relentlessly hybrid corn. That's probably something that couldn't happen today. There might be a little bit of a conflict of interest there. <laughs> but he was so sure that hybrid corn was right for American farmers that he was going to use all of his resources to, to push it. And, it. and he wasn't just pushing pioneer hybrids at the time. He was pushing hybrids in general. Just so happened we had the best ones of so. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of idea about uh, DuPont Pioneer. So if you look at 1926, when we started with our hybrids, by 1990s we were into biotechnology. And now, as, as of 2015, we're working really hard on gem, genome editing. And that's something I'll just mention a little bit, uh, briefly, a little bit later. Uh, but as an agronomist, I like to see that top bubble and that overarching ag agronomic research and agronomic services. You can't really have one without the other. You need the breeding, the biotechnology, and the agronomic services to go together. Um, so that's really what we're all about. And, you'll see genome editing being more and more talked about in coming years. So when it comes to resource utilization, a lot of what we do at Pioneer is stress-related research uh, for maize and, <coughs> and, and drought issues. So when we look at yield, we, see, we break it down to resource capture plus resource use efficiency by partitioning. And that kind of provides a framework for what our scientists do. And when they get into the physiological targets, it's more about they get into water capture, uh, water status, especially at critical times of that plant life cycle. Uh, of course, the flowering time, uh, the grain filling time, incredibly important and sensitive periods of time for that plant. Of course, the holy grail, transpiration and photosynthesis. Uh, and we look a lot at the carbon and nitrogen balance in that plant. Uh, a lot of what we do on the transgenic side has to do with plant growth regulators and how they affect that, how that plant is reacting to stress. Some of this can be seen in product, products that we brought through recently. I don't know if you've heard of Aquamax. It's been out on the market for four or five years now. It's been extremely popular for us. Uh, we put it into, we put this technology into numerous backgrounds now because it, it has proved very valuable and the, and the growers uh, really like it. What we've been able to do with Aquamax is really put that plant, that crop, into a better position when it gets to the flowering period and the grain filling period. Uh, and there's a publication on that. I should mention. A lot of what I'm talking about here is backed by a publication somewhere. In my last slide, if anybody's interested, has all the references I've, I'm talking about. So you can dig into this further if you like. But really with Aquamax, what we found is there's, there's greater water resources left actually in the soil by the time it gets to that flowering stage. And so there's this additional stay green, there's this additional silking that's allowed to happen. And of course, kernels don't abort as easily if you have this extra bit of reserve. So it, you know, by the time you get to the grain filling period, it's, it's enough to have a different, be the difference between a barren cob and having some kernels on that cob. So a really fascinating piece of research uh, that went on. Um, and we've, we've published on it 
in a number of different ways. So that's available uh, as much as we've been able to share. Uh, from the transgenic pr uh, traits platform, I mentioned plant growth regulators. So one of the plant growth regulator pathways we really honed in on is the ethylene pathway. And we found ways to either, during stressful periods, ethylene is produced, of course. We found ways to either lower the production of ethylene in that plant for different periods of time, or to make the plant less sensitive to ethylene at different periods of time. And in both cases, what we found is that allows the silks to emerge in greater number and healthier. It also allows uh, kernels to hang in there during the stressful period and, and hopefully work through the stressful period and still fill that kernel. Uh, it helps in stay green so that that photosynthetic capacity is retained for when it's really needed during that grain filling period. Uh, and we, we really hope to bring some products through based on some of that technology. And this, this as well has been published uh, on a couple of times. So we're, we're sharing as much as we can. One of the reasons we do uh, endorse a publication strategy in trying to share our information is because we want to be more transparent about what transgenics is all about and what breeding is all about. So regulatory agencies uh, and those who oppose GMs poten potentially can become more familiar with what we're doing and we think with familiarity it might breed some acceptance and with acceptance maybe there will be fewer organizations and individuals around the world uh, bashing something they maybe don't understand. So that's a big part of what we do and it's part of my job too is to encourage the publications if not actually writing them myself because I'm not that good at that. <laughs> but encourage others to, to publish and, and get the information out there. So another area that we work pretty hard on is hybrid technologies for other crops besides corn. You know, in corn, we're pretty, I think we're really spoiled, right? You pull that tassel off and, you know, Henry, Henry Wallace 90 years ago could do that and you get the cross that you want. Of course, now we've developed cytoplasmic male sterility for some of these crops, uh, but even that is a little bit clunky, a little bit problematic because you have to work so hard to get to that, that maintainer and restorer line before you can really get to the working on the traits you really want to work on and, and you don't have a broad germplasm base to work with if you're, if you're stuck with CMS. So we think we've got some solutions to hybrid, hybrid strategies and crops like wheat, sorghum uh, and rice. Uh, we think we can say something about bringing higher quality hybrids through quicker. Gary mentioned the pro challenges in Africa as far as turnover of, of the crop. Uh, and getting a new hybrid out there more often. Uh, if we could bring the cost of goods down, make that hybrid production easier uh, for these small and medium-sized seed companies, I think we would see a lot more turnover. And, and these seed companies wouldn't be so hesitant to bring out a new hybrid that's a higher quality hybrid. And then I think we'd see some competition in Africa and maybe other countries, the kind of competition we have here, and then yield would start climbing. That's, that's the aspiration anyway. Uh, we also believe, if, and, and I think this is well documented in the literature, that hybrids do much better under stress with input utilization, nitrogen, water, uh, sometimes biotic stress. So that's another reason why we believe hybrids are very important for a lot of crops. And, and it's an underused technology in a lot of cases. When you think about climate change, I hear a lot about, well, we need to uh, have climate smart agriculture. Climate smart agriculture, that's kind of the new buzzword. Well, what does climate smart agriculture really mean? Nobody ever talks about using hybrids as a solution to climate smart agriculture. I think, I think it could very well be uh, a strong solution. Um, and we're working towards that in different ways, including genome editing and CRISPR-Cas. Now, you will be hard pressed to find a pioneer guy giving a presentation without talking about genome editing and CRISPR-Cas. This is, a, this is gonna be a big area for us in coming years, uh, and we're pretty excited about it. Uh, one of the reasons we are so excited about it is because we see the, the simplest, in the simplest form of CRISPR-Cas, it's simply making mutations, and mutations have never been regulated. Uh, we've been making mutations using chemicals and radiation for decades, right? 
those mutations, that process has never been regulated really in any way. And, it's, and, it, and with CRISPR-Cas, you can just do a much more accurate, precise, more predictive way of making mutations. So that's exciting for us. You know, with radiation and, and chemicals, you, you know, you dose your plant, uh, you hope for the best, and you try to find something that's valuable. With CRISPR-Cas, you know, as long as you know something about the genes you're after, you can go after those genes and really make a difference. I think there is a part of CRISPR-Cas that is definitely transgenic, and we don't argue that, and we don't argue that it should be regulated, but quite possibly it will be regulated less. And, and how exciting could that be? Because now with, with transgenic traits, you know, you have to have this massive regulatory machine behind you to be able to commercialize anything. Think if you could, think if research organizations, small companies, academics could now have this tool available to them without this massive regulatory burden on top of them. You know, guys like me, that might not be needed anymore, right? That wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, I could find employment somewhere else. Uh, that's something that we strive for with CRISPR-Cas. So something to think about. Uh, this last this slide here on agronomic services is really, again, because I'm an agronomist, I'm not going to leave this behind. We see the 90 years of agronomic research being able to pull it together now and make that available to a farmer so he can make much better decisions on nitrogen use, on planting density, eventually we hope on irrigation and water use, uh, and, it, and it's a, a tool that will be in his hand that he can use on the fly to make some really good decisions. So we're working really hard on our agronomic services as well. Uh, and, and Circa is the name of it. There are, there are also a number of others out there from different companies. Um, and I think this is going to be very helpful as we go forward if you think of nitrogen, still one of the, the, you know, as far as an environmental concern, nitrogen is still, I think, right at the top of the list. I think we've got some answers to, to those issues, those environmental issues, that will help a farmer both be more prosperous as well as help him do the right thing from an environmental standpoint. So uh, let's take a look at some of the global challenges that uh, I think are probably big deals for us going forward in the next uh, few decades. Uh, I think we have to say something about climate change. You know, it's been ongoing for a, for a while. Uh, there are still climate change deniers out there. Uh, and I think even if you're a climate change denier, I think we can maybe all agree on the fact that it's probably not a good idea to be spewing greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere at record levels like we've never seen before on the planet. Uh, there will be some, there are some that argue that perhaps temperature isn't climbing quite as high or quite as consistently as people say. That may be true. There are people that say that, you know, the severe weather events are just part of life. They always have been. Um, but I do believe we need to be ready for drought and then more ready than we are today. If you think back to 2012 when we had that drought, prices spiked really high and things got out of whack in a hurry. Uh, now let's think if we had a drought that lasted more than a year or two, I think we'd really be in a bad spot, and I think we need to work harder at that. And uh, we also, besides looking at climate change for some proof that we need to, to do a better job and ready ourselves more, I like to look at history. There's a guy down at the University of Missouri by the name of Michael Stambaugh. Who knows what dendrochronology is? I'm kind of giving it away here. It's the study of tree rings, right? So Michael Stambaugh and his team, they go into these stream beds, they find these fossilized oak trees that are buried, they dig them out, they carbon date them, and they put a story together of going, in this, in this particular publication, they went back to 992 AD, so over a thousand years ago, right? And they look at drought and say, okay, what were the worst drought years? So in the past 1,000 years, 1020 AD was the worst drought year on history, according to their work. Uh, something was going on in the 19th century because the second, third, sixth, and eighth worst droughts were in the 19th century, 1800s. They also looked at multi-year droughts. Again, 19th century. The first and the third worst droughts were in the 19th century. Uh, and, and Michael's a, he's an interesting character and he's very soft-spoken, uh, but 
you know, you try to get, draw some conclusions out of him, and he says, well, we're probably due. We're probably due for a big one, right? So he kind of puts the fear of God into you a little bit, right? Uh, and again, going back to the 2012 drought, look what that did to, to food prices, because right? there's a lot of pressure on our, on our system right now. We have too many droughts like we had in the 19th century, um, and we're asking for it. So, uh, I don't mean to scare anybody here, that's not the idea. I'm, a, I'm a, half, a glass half full kind of a guy, I'm a fairly optimistic guy. I think we do have the tools and technology to do, to do better. Uh, another thing we need to be aware of, of course, is the emerging middle class. I like to use China as an example in their meat consumption. That red line is China, that's their meat consumption. They're up over 70 million metric tons annually, and about 90% of that is pork. Uh, the blue line is the U.S. Uh, we are actually starting to go down a little bit in meat consumption. Uh, the idea here is that when you have a pent-up demand and people get a little bit of extra money in their pocket, the first thing they do is send their kids to school. The second thing they do is put a high-quality protein on the table, and that's what's going on in China. Okay? My sisters, I have two sisters. One is a vegetarian, and every once in a while she likes to stick the knife in me and, said, look, and say, look, we can solve a lot of the world's environmental problems if we just eat less meat. Right? And I, I don't really have much to say to her. I was like, okay, that's maybe true. Right? And I think in the U.S., if you look, maybe we are eating less meat, and maybe that's a positive thing. Uh, in a lot of parts of the world, though, telling people to eat less meat is like standing in front of the freight train. It is not, it's not possible, right? The Chinese love pork. It's a cultural, religious nourishment for them, right? And we see the same things in Africa in a lot of times. Uh, certain foods are so meaningful, you can't tell them to stop eating. So we need to do a better job of getting prepared. And if you think about Africa, here's a statistic for you, and this is from the UNICEF. By 2050, 40% of all under fives will be African, right? That's a lot, and I question this, and I've tried to do the math, uh, and it actually, it actually is possible because a lot of the big population centers, their birth rates are going down, Africa is still spiking, right? So it could very well be possible. The other part of Africa, and here's what you don't hear too much, is that these economies are growing. We're gonna face the same thing of two billion Africans as we do out of China with meat consumption. They love high quality protein as much as anybody, right? Uh, so I think we need to do more to get ready where the food is consumed. Uh, I, I just found that statistic fascinating. So that means by 2100, 40% of all people on the earth will be African, right? Is that crazy? Because I think right now, I think 20% about 20% are Chinese, and we think that's a lot. We haven't seen anything yet. It's coming. So here's a study that I just came across this week, and I had to use it somehow. And let me explain a little bit to you. Number one, I fell in love with it because I used Cameroon, right? When does that ever happen? Uh, so you know, I immediately had some common ground with these guys. But I think, and I think this fits perfectly with the symposium today, because the, what they said in this article in the introduction is said, look. For all this time, we've been looking at food production and food supply as our metric. Those are the metrics that we use to determine what's good and bad, right? And what they're saying is, no, we need to expand that thinking. It needs to be more than that. There's seven different metrics that they are proposing that we look at. And in these little graphics, the further you are, the further those darts are out to the, the dots are out to the edge, the better off you are, right? Uh, so look at food safety, number six there, and look at U.S., it's way out to the edge, right? So very safe food supply. Cameroon, number six, not so much, pretty much to the interior. So uh, something we need to work on there. Uh, ecosystem sustainability, number two, U.S. is kind of in the middle. Of the nine countries they looked at, there was no, really nobody better than the U.S. The Netherlands and the U.S. were about equal on ecosystem sustainability. What that tells me is we have work to do. You know, we've, got, we've made some progress, but we have work to do. Uh, Cameroon, really towards the middle there. A lot of work to do on ecosystem sustainability. And if you think back to the, the photos I showed you way at the beginning of, of out there trying to get the cassava going, uh, I've, I've always wondered about that system because, you know, you're, you're chopping down the rainforest, 
you're burning it, CO2 into the atmosphere, you plant your cassava, it's a heavy nutrient feeder, uh, potassium, phosphorus. You can't go back to that ground for another quite a few years, five, ten years even with cassava. They avoid it. So as we need more and more land into production, that's a tough situation. And they don't use fertilizer. They absolutely refused. I tried to find fertilizer for them. They said, don't bother. We're not going to put it on our cassava for whatever reason. Uh, now, look at food waste. United States, they're number seven. We, you know, we waste a fair amount of food. Cameroon, much further out to the edge, and I can attest to that. Food in Cameroon is much more sacred than food here in the U.S. So, some solutions. Uh, yep, I'm doing okay. So here's a study from some ecologists at the University of Minnesota, West and all. I don't know if anybody's seen this before. You know, when I see something like this and I learn that, you know, when I look at ecologists talking about agriculture and agronomy, I get that kind of creepy feeling. It's like, uh-oh, here we go. Uh, they're talking about something that I know about and I'm not gonna like it. But no, so I would encourage everybody so I was like, okay, step back, Jim. Get, open your mind up. Try to listen a little bit. Try to learn something. Sure enough, they make some really good points. And their point is, there are certain leverage points in certain, in certain cropping systems around the globe where if we can learn more and do a better job on those leverage points, we can have a much more sustainable planet, a much more livable planet. And they looked at you know, some of their leverage points they talked about, uh, irrigation. So look at China for a second. 30% excess nitrogen, 33% nitrogen, 36% excess phosphorus, and 28% nitrous oxide emissions coming from China. So <coughs> one thing I learned about China over the last few years is that their nitrogen fertilizer is subsidized because they want to grow more corn, right? So it's pretty cheap for them. So if a little nitrogen is good, a lot must be better, right? <laughs> Probably not where you want to go if you want an environmentally sound cropping system. Now look at the United States. Uh, we're doing much better in a lot of different areas. You know, a, a third to a fourth of the excess that we see in China, 13% uh, excess uh, or nitrous oxide emissions. So we're doing a lot better. I would say the 11% nitrogen mentioned earlier is one thing we still got to work on. This bears that out. Uh, one thing the study doesn't talk about is the productivity of of North American agriculture. So we're probably two to four times more productive than the Chinese with a third to a fourth of the waste and the excess. So we're doing something right. Uh, not to say that we can't do better, right? We need, to, we need to keep doing better. And we need to keep exporting that technology so others can do better with it as well. And one thing I think we can learn from, here's a study from Nebraska by Grassini and Kassman. And they had a, just an uh, excellent data set because they have these natural resource districts uh, for irrigation purposes in Nebraska. So they have a lot of data available to them. They looked at the situation. They said, look, there's efficient use of water going, out, going on out here because the aquifer does recharge in these areas because they all have meters on their pumps, right? Not everybody has a meter in different parts of the world or even different parts of the U.S. So they can use their water much more efficiently than they have in the past. They can put their nitrogen on through their irrigation system. So they get their nitrogen on at just the right time as well. So very efficient use of nitrogen. They don't have nitrate problems in the groundwater anymore in Nebraska because of these situations. It's a very high net energy yield with very low greenhouse gas emissions. So when I saw this study, I thought, holy smokes, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, CNN, they're going to be covering this because this is lots of answers to the world's problems and climate change, right? So who picked it up? the local Lincoln newspaper. That's the only dang newspaper that picked it up. So I've, I've made a habit of trying to incorporate this in my talks because it's, to me it's exciting. It has a lot of answers for the rest of the world. We can study what's going on here. Uh, we're doing these things in Iowa today. If you think of that uh, nutrient management plan that Iowa State was very much part of a couple of years ago that gets bashed every single day by the Des Moines Register, there's a lot of excellent uh, information in that nutrient strategy plan. And, and farmers are working on these things every day, but we don't get a whole lot of credit for it. Uh, back to my favorite crop, cassava. Now, you look at, so last uh, March, right, I was back there 
I'm trying to plant cassava. That picture of those roots there, that's production. This was, that photo was taken in December. So it's growing, it's producing, I'm really happy. But thinking about applying that information that we learned in Nebraska more broadly, there's other crops and other regions that need technology applied more broadly. Cassava, it's a perennial plant with a long life cycle, very weak flowering habit, uh, very complex genetics, difficult to breed with. Any cassava breeders in the audience? You're a smart group. I, I was talking to Tim Setter, Dr. Setter at Cornell, and he works on cassava. He says, yeah, you know, we get one breeding cycle every four or five years. Oh, can you imagine? So if you have a really full career, 40 years let's say, you might have 10 breeding cycles in your career. This is a crop that is crying out for biotechnology and something like CRISPR-Cas. As we learn more about these genes, I think we can have a real impact on crops like this uh, as far as improving them. And it's a crop that's valuable to hundreds of millions of very poor people that rely on it for food. So it's important that we get, get busy with a crop like this. Um, I thought of stevia when I was seeing the, uh, where is he that gave the, oh, there you are. I was thinking of stevia as in breeding, you know, a perennial plant, you know, we don't know much about it. As we learn more about these genes, there might be some opportunities there to really spark that uh, sugar content and make it even sweeter. Uh, another project that we're, we're working on uh, directly, uh, it's too bad Gary had to leave because he might have had, could talk a little bit about this, uh, improved maize for African soils. So these African soils are very weathered, they're old, a lot of iron and aluminum oxides and very low organic matter. So if you see, if you don't have any nitrogen, if you're not applying nitrogen, uh, you, it's really difficult to grow a crop. Um, and they use a lot of really old hybrids. This whole project with these, with these partners that we're working with, and we're, applying, we're bringing the technology, uh, we hope, that's gonna be useful. Uh, we think we can do a better job here. Uh, more hybrids, higher value hybrids, higher quality hybrids, and efficient use of nitrogen, whether it's through native, tra native traits, improved breeding, improved hybrids, or through transgenic traits. Uh, so a really neat project, really happy to be part of that. Uh, another area where we're working on directly, as far as bringing technology more broadly, is sorghum and millet in Africa. Uh, last October, we brought a big group together in Montpellier uh, from a lot of different countries and organizations, and lo and behold, by the end of the th second day, we were all getting tired, and we said, well, let's concentrate on the seed systems, agronomy, product development, and market and value chains. When Pioneer thinks of a seed system, we don't th think of the research and the breeding. It goes all the way through to that end user and marketing to that end user, and then even the, the, the processor sometimes, right? That's a lot of times what's missing in Africa. That smallholder farmer does not have access to inputs, and he does not have access to be able to sell his crop on a consistent basis. And if that's not there, the formal seed system completely collapses. It cannot function without access to the markets. So uh, we are continuing to work with the uh, Agropolis Foundation. They're based in Montpellier, uh, a good group. Uh, and we're, <coughs> excuse me, we're bringing in a, a core team out of this initial meeting to really see if we can make some headway in seed systems. Uh, and maybe there's even some in the audience that might be able to provide some uh, guidance to us as we go along. So I hesitated about using this slide because you're just gonna think I'm bragging. And I am. That's probably why you'll think it. Uh, but I, I just came across this yesterday. It came across uh, my desk and I had to include it because I'm very, I'm very proud to be part of an organization that has leadership that sees the importance in, in doing this kind of thing. So there's this access to seeds index, and the Gates Foundation actually helps uh, resource this. And uh, what it says under the, uh, that top heading is bridging the gap between the world's leading seed companies and the smallholder farmer. And the other caption is, many smallholder farmers yet to be reached some seed companies showing leadership. And the little bubble there is DuPont Pioneer. So we were ranked number one in the Access to Seeds Index. And this was the first time they've done this. Uh, and I remember last year getting questions from somebody and, and my boss said, you need to answer those questions because this is important. I was like, oh, okay. And they kept asking me questions. And it was for this. 
And they said, okay, what are you doing in Africa? What are you doing in India? Da, 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 da. I kept answering the questions, like, okay, I don't have time for this. Uh, but I answered them all. Lo and behold, I, I didn't realize I was answering them for the seed index. Uh, so I was really pleased to see that, you know, multinationals, a lot of time, we get, we get banged up for, um, you know, not doing the right thing uh, and not using our technology wisely. So I'm really pleased that we are finally being recognized for something very positive because we do work very hard uh, at going after smallholder farmers, whether it's our business operations and providing access to seeds and agronomic knowledge, or whether it's our development projects like the Sorghum Millet Convening, the Improved Maize for African Soils effort, uh, and other things we might be doing. So um, it's good to see that. So finishing up now, how does this, any of this relate to you? So as far as career options and opportunities, I just want you to understand it's a big world out there. There's, there's lots of opportunities that you might not be thinking of as a grad student. Even, <coughs> excuse me, even me, you know, as I was going through my career, you know, a little over five years ago, my, what turned out to be my hiring manager at DuPont Pioneer called me. And he says, Jim, have you ever thought about a career in regulatory? And I said, you know, what I wanted to say was not just no, but heck no. I'm not going there. Uh, and, but I bit my tongue, of course. You know, you don't, you don't burn bridges unless you really have to. Uh, and I said, sure, I, you know, I'll consider that. Come out for, you know, and so he says, well, come out for an interview. So I interviewed with a number of people, found out that it's a very fascinating area and that there are, there's so much behind the industry and affairs and regulatory group. That's really exciting. It's really, it's, it's fun to be part of. So it's just an example of, you know, keep your options open. Keep an open mind as to what's, what the potential is. Skill sets to think about. Uh, communication is huge. You know, your scientific writing, your scientific presentations, you know, uh, uh, forums like this are excellent to be able to get in front of people and practice and, and, and work at that. But even more than the scientific piece of it, I think I would, you know, I want to challenge you guys to do a much better job and to work very hard at communicating complex and complicated science to non-scientists. Because think about it. About 99% of the world is non-scientists. You're kind of the oddballs, right? You have to get better at communicating what you do to others. Think of all the problems we've had with transgenic traits. You know, as a scientist, we look at it and say, wow, this is the greatest stuff ever. This is going to be so cool. And look how safe it is. Well, 99% of the world is scratching their head and thinking, what are they talking about? I don't know what this is. I'm not sure it's safe. Can you tell me it's safe? Can you prove it's safe? Yeah, heck yes we can. But we haven't done a good job of communicating that. We're working very hard with, very hard with our genome editing efforts to do a much better job of the communication piece. Um, so think about that. Uh, Land-grant university system. You know, when I was in grad school and undergrad, I was in the land-grant university system because my mom and dad and my older sister who went to University of Minnesota said, yeah, you're going to Minnesota. So, oh, okay. Uh, I didn't really think about how lucky I was to be there. And then grad school, heck, I had an assistantship and my tuition was paid for. Looking back, I'm thinking, holy smokes, how good do I have it? At the time, I didn't think of it that way. All I was thinking, I was like, God dang, I gotta write another project for my major <laughs> professor and these books are expensive, woo. But the land-grant university system is the envy of the world. I've seen this over and over. It doesn't exist in the form we have it here today. Uh, so don't, you know, take it seriously. It's a great place to be. And you guys, the rigor, here's the other part of it is, the rigor of the scientific training that you guys are undergoing is, is not seen anywhere else. And I, and I go to a lot of different conferences. Uh, and it's always good to come back to the Tri Society Conference, the Agronomy, Breeding, Plant Science, and, and get back into this rigor, because a lot of other scientific organizations don't have that rigor. So keep that in mind. So I guess the bottom line is there's a lot of different directions you can take with your education. I think, I think the bottom line is it's important to focus, do a good job on your education, and then you know the world is your oyster. There's a lot of cool things going on. There's a lot of challenges out there, 
Uh, my career is, you know, I've, I've got kind of a short sight here now, right? I can only go so far. Uh, but I have all the confidence in the world that the grad students in the audience today are going to pick it up and do even better than, than we've ever seen before. So that's it. Thank you very much. So there's, there's my reference list. You probably can't read it from there, but maybe it can be distributed if you're at all curious. It looks like we have some time for questions, but for those on the webinar, if you're having problems viewing, uh, if you clear your cookies and cache, it seems to be helping some people. So try that. Sure. Uh, last week, I was at the Soybean Breeders Workshop, and um, <clears throat> and we, some of us were discussing that in New Zealand, uh, the uh, the editing technique has been declared uh, GMO. And uh, and so then, right now, it was my understanding that uh, the USDA here in in the US. Uh, it's going to start entering those discussions and uh, how they are going to deal with the gene editing techniques. And so I was wondering if you have any insight of that and um, if you are, are part of, are going to be part of those discussions because I think that topic is going to become of greater interest for everybody. Yep. So the question is about gene editing and regulation. In New Zealand, they've ruled that the gene editing will be considered GM in a transgenic trait and will be regulated probably pretty heavily. Um, we are in those conversations where we're allowed to be, and we try to drive ourselves into other conversations and create the conversation ourselves in, in different ways. Uh, so we try to be as, as involved as we can be. What we know today is this is going to be a country by country issue. All right, so it's going to be it's going to be challenging. Uh, in New Zealand, I think the, the the very simplest gene editing of just creating a simple mutation, the jury is still out on that. I, what I understand is nobody's really made a firm decision on that. The scientific bodies in Europe, probably one of the most difficult places to work right now, uh, the scientific bodies in Europe have said that mutation process is not transgenic. Whether the regulatory bodies will listen to their scientists, we don't really know. So we're working on it, it's case by case basis, it's going to be a while. I think the USDA, you know, as I mentioned before, they're very objective, science-based. I don't think they're going to care about the mutation piece either. So that at least will hopefully give some of us room to operate. Um, thank you for the insightful presentation. I noticed, so you're in regulatory, but you haven't mentioned that you've also been a lawyer or have any sort of juris doctorate. So I'm just curious how you got into regulatory without being a lawyer, and you seem to be a scientist first, and do you closely work with lawyers, or how does that all work for the job? Ah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So no, I am not a lawyer. Uh, like I said, my last official training I had was as an agronomist. Uh, but in the regulatory world, we have resources all around us. And as a regulatory strategy lead, I work with all these folks to try to develop the strategy of how we're going to go forward. And then we bring in the expertise as we go along. So uh, we do have, you know, sheds full of lawyers that give us more advice than we ever could dream of or want, but, we, but they're good folks. Uh, you know, another big team I work with is the regulatory science team. So they're the ones that develop the protocols and the studies to demonstrate the, the safety to human health and the environment. So they're a good group. But from a, from a regulatory point of view, you have to really be involved right from the discovery stage of these transgenic traits all the way to commercialization. So you can't really be an expert in any one thing in the role I have. You just kind of have to be a jack of all trades and know who in the organization to pull in then. So from that perspective, it's really fun because you get to talk to a lot of interesting people, including the lawyers. That's all the time we have left for questions, but let's thank them one more time.